We meet in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. And it's lovely and warm in here today. Thank goodness. Lovely to be able to say that. A warm welcome to St. Luke's on this fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Um, I think I know everybody here. It's difficult to see behind us, but um, if you are new or visiting, um, it's great to see you. My name is David Trahan, I'm the vicar of the parish and this morning I'll be leading the service and James, our reader, one of our readers, will be preaching to us and for us. Later on in the service we'll be having a little bit of a presentation for our Ethan. Um, so great to see you Ethan and um, yeah, look out for that a bit later on. have to wake up for that bit then. <laughs> We come from scattered lives. I don't know what we've been up to during the last week. We've all come from different things in different places, all kinds of things happening. We gather together as God's people. And that process of gathering, coming together as the body of Christ is a really special and important thing as we heard last week from St. Paul. We come, we gather together to meet with God in worship Hopefully to encounter him through the scriptures. Hopefully to encounter him in one another. And I just want to invite us all, as we gather, to be open. I was really cut to the heart last week before my preach. I didn't think I was going to be able to preach. About being open to the Lord. Being open as we gather. Open to his spirit. Open to his word. Open to his call open to one another, open to be able to respond to what he has for us. So we pray that we might be open. And as we open ourselves up to God, as we open ourselves, we can become alive. And I'm just going to read you a little piece from Brian McLaren before we worship in song. This is really good. There's no sound system this morning, so I'm going to have to project my voice, and hopefully you can all hear. <laughs> Becoming alive. What we all want is pretty simple, really. We want to be alive. To feel alive. Not just to exist, but to thrive, to live out loud, walk tall, breathe free. We want to be less lonely, less exhausted, less conflicted or afraid, more awake, more grateful, more energised and purposeful. We capture this kind of mindful, overbrimming life in terms like well-being, shalom, blessedness, wholeness, harmony, life to the full, and aliveness. It's what we're hoping for when we pray. It's why we gather, celebrate, eat, abstain, attend, practice, sing, and contemplate. When people say, I'm spiritual, what they mean, I think, is simple. I'm seeking aliveness. So as we worship this morning, may we be open to the Lord and become alive in his love. So I invite you to stand with your blue song books and we're going to have a time of worship through song. Some of you may know the songs really well, some of you may not know them at all. Just pray the words if you don't know them. But be open to just touching God and allowing God to touch you and me. So we'll start with number 45, I will worship, and then we'll go into the back section of the book with our crazy system in our books to number one, above all powers. So please stand and I'll lead you through. Thank you, musicians.
allow the musicians to play and just rest in God's presence. by your Holy Spirit so we may become alive alive in your love touch our hearts and heal us this morning as we meet with you in Jesus name Amen. You can remain standing or, or seated for our next song, which is number 73, More Love, More Power.
take a seat. Thank you. We turn to our sheets. And before we pray the prayer together, let's just be still and silent. And together we pray, Lord, may we live, work and pray as one body in Christ. Do nothing apart which we can do together, and do together what we cannot do apart. Amen. We come to meet with God, but not just as individuals. We rejoice at our individual relationships with the Lord, but coming together as church, we remember that we are one body, joined together <coughs> by the Spirit in the love of Christ. We are brothers and sisters within the family of faith, children of the same Heavenly Father. And so, we rejoice that we come to God with different backgrounds and glorify Him in our own individual ways. But we know we do not always treat each other as we should. As brothers and sisters in God's family, together we ask our Father for forgiveness. Dear Lord, we confess that Christians have despised and persecuted each other in the past and today, out of fear, out of a desire for power, out of a misunderstanding of what the Gospel demands. We confess to you, O God, that there are things we ourselves have done and things we ourselves have left undone that hinder the building up of the body of Christ. Lord, we hear your call to repentance, to change our hearts, minds, attitudes and behaviours towards one another. We ask for forgiveness and for grace, that we may live differently and fulfil your commandments. And so together... May the Lord forgive us for all that we have done wrongly and all we have left undone. May he give us the grace to accept in humility the differences of one another in Christ and rejoice in the gifts that our sisters and brothers in Christ can give us, so that everyone may know that we are Jesus' disciples because we love one another. Amen. Tell you what, it's a joy to be a part of the body of Christ in this place. I love the fact that we're so eclectic. Um, you know, as I talk to, to you, people with so many different experiences of church and, um, and experiences of God. And it's just wonderful that God knits us all together as his family. We should rejoice in that. And though we may struggle with some things at times, there's some beautiful things some beautiful things amongst us. And it's a joy to be brothers and sisters. So we're about to have our, our Bible readings. 
Well, let's pray the collect for today. God of heaven, you send the gospel to the ends of the earth and your messengers to every nation. Send your Holy Spirit to transform us by the good news of everlasting life. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Kathy's going to bring our first reading from 1 Corinthians 13. I think it's going to be a slightly different version. Thought you might enjoy this one, Ethan. 1 Corinthians 13, and it's from the Message version of the Bible. But now I want to lay out a far better way for you. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I am nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor, and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with anything. Trusts God always. Always looks for the best and never looks back. But keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over some day. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We only know a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be cancelled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like any infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, and love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Cathy. Now, Ruth is going to bring our reading from Luke's Gospel. Continue to try and stay alert and open to the Word. The Gospel reading is taken from Luke 4, verses 21 to 30. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there are many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, 
but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Well, may I speak loudly and clearly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I hope you are listening to both passages of Scripture today, but I'm only going to preach from the first one, from 1 Corinthians. I did think it was an odd pairing when I saw the two passages on the road zone, and even questioned David about it, but he said, no, that's, that's okay. Um, anyway, if you were to have a close look at my Bible, the one I tend to look at and have you know, in the kitchen on the table, there's something you might notice about the pages at today's reading from Corinthians. I don't know if I should be pleased or ashamed, really, because these pages are amongst the grubbiest pages in my Bible. What I mean is that there's an accumulation of thumb and fingerprints uh, on the edges of the page um, from over the years. Now, Julia bought me this Bible to commemorate when we got engaged 38 years ago tomorrow. So now, to a forensic, quickly moving on, to a forensic <laughs> analyst, these and other pages, some with very few fingerprints and possibly some with none, would probably reveal my Bible reading habits. So I, I love this Bible, not just because of the, the text, but also what it means. You know, it has symbol for me, um, and it often just opens where I want it to open more than just 1 Corinthians 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is often known as the love chapter. And what I mean by that, it's, it's probably, if you go to a wedding, there's a good chance you'll hear this read. Whereas if you come to church, there's a good chance you won't hear it read, because it actually doesn't feature in our Sunday lectionary very often. It would be today, uh, which is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, we're more likely to mark... Uh, the presentation of Christ in the temple and Simeon. So, listen carefully. Indeed, this chapter was read at our daughter's wedding a couple of years back. Uh, more than that, it was a passage that my mother had chosen to be read at her funeral coming up to two years ago. But that's, that's possibly a different story for another occasion, although I do touch on that later. Now, Paul, the writer of this letter, did not have weddings in mind when he wrote it. Yes, I think that's what he wants, I want to say, because... Yes, that's right, let me start. Although Paul, the writer of this letter, didn't have weddings in mind when he wrote it, verses 4 to, uh, four to 7 really do apply and form an excellent basis for a married life together. But if you're, if you're wondering, I'm not talking about, and neither is Paul writing here about romantic or sexual love. That would be the Greek word eros, from which we get the English word erotic. Now eros, as a Greek word, does not even appear in the New Testament Greek. There is, however, erotic literature in the Bible, and if you want to find that, look at Song of Solomon. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, unlike Tudor, and if I say anything wrong now, I'm sure Tudor will gently take me to one side and, um, and maybe point out the error of my ways. But I do refer and have uh, occasional Greek letters in engineering formula in my work. And the most recent Greek that I've been learning uh, are the names of the COVID-19 variants. <laughs> Now, I wonder whether the next one's going to be called Omega, which can mean the end, which is great, but it can also mean everlasting. 
Oh, it's good. Clearly yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know that there are at least four Greek words that are translated into English as love. And this can be an issue to us. Words like love have many different meanings. For example, I could say, I love red wine. I say to Julia, although probably not frequently enough, I love you. Now, the love I have for red wine is not clearly the same as I have for Julia. <laughs> <laughs> No. Though the various words for love are translated, the Greek words are say, translated into the same English word, the word that Paul is using here is agape. This is the type of love that the Bible speaks most about. To the Greeks, agape meant a general empathy uh, or loving kindness to, to all people. And indeed, as Christians, we would be expected to love people in that sort of way, in the name of Christ. However, the Bible raises the bar. Agape love in the Bible is the love that comes from God. It's part of his character. It comes from an outpouring of who he is, because God is love. Read the first letter to John, uh, chapter 4 in particular, and that's full of agape love. God is the source of love. So he's our standard. His love for us, unconditional, unrelenting, undiminishing. It's sacrificial. It's everlasting. And such love really is a great foundation for any relationship including a marriage. Okay, so if Paul didn't have marriage in mind when he wrote this passage, then what was it about? And a clue is where this passage occurs. I think also a clue, uh, as Kathy read, because she read the last verse of the previous chapter, which is, and now I will show you the most excellent way. So it's and, it means it follows on from something else. So chapter 13 is meant to be read in context of chapter 12 and 14 that follows. Chapter 12 has some teaching about spiritual gifts, those gifts that serve and help the Christian community. Anna spoke on this two weeks ago. And also that chapter uh, talks about unity within the body of Christ with its many parts that David talked about last week. And on the other side, chapter 14, Paul gives additional instructions to the church in Corinth about particular spiritual gifts and orderly worship. So chapter 13 is meant to be read alongside 12 and 14, not taken in isolation or out of context. The theory from 12 is meant to be applied, as in 14, in the light of love in chapter 13. Of course, the letter didn't have chapters like that. That's just for our convenience to help find things really fast. Now, I hope that you remember that David said and has written about in his letter in the, in the winter edition of The Link magazine that this year he very much wants us and encourages us to think about community. We've missed out so much, haven't we, in the last two years on community. So we need to rebuild that and rebuild each other in that. And it is to a community of Christian believers in Corinth that Paul is writing this letter. They are there as the body of Christ, exercising spiritual gifts, meeting together in worship. Okay, they're not perfect, that's clear from what Paul is saying. 2,000 years on, we are here in this parish whether in person or online, as a community of, of Christian believers, the body of Christ that exercises spiritual gifts meets together to worship. We're not perfect. Jesus' command to his church was, and is to us now, that we love one another. So this passage of scripture, God's word, 
applies as much to us today as it did for the church in Corinth. So let's deepen our understanding of the most Christ-like characteristics imaginable, love. Now this passage divides into three neat parts. First, Paul insists, using himself as an example, that everything that he does, therefore everything that we do as an individual as a, and as a community, is meaningless without love. Speaking in tongues or languages of any kind, and I guess that includes English, is without love just <coughs> incomprehensible noise. Exercising spiritual gifts, prophecy knowledge, and all the others that are listed there. Without love, it's nothing. Giving what we have to the poor, even giving our lives to be martyrs, without love, gains us nothing. So what then is the motivation for what we do as a Christian community? Because we've done so much. Is it our worship? Is it our reordering projects past and present and future? Is it our children's or our youth work or even the well-being project? These are all good and admirable, but it's good to check what our motive is. Because without love, we're just making a noise. We're nothing and we gain nothing. <coughs> So what does Paul mean by love? And that's where we refer, we, we refer to the middle part of this chapter. The nitty gritty, if you like. So here, Paul defines Christian love. And he uses 15 verbal phrases. You can count them. I don't know what the message, how that works out. Because uh, I think there's a little bit of amplification there. But it is really good to compare the Bible versions and, and add to the list because different words are used at the same sort of uh, verbal phrase. So they're actions or quality behaviours that love brings about. And we could have a sermon series for 15 weeks just looking at each one in turn. Now, I once heard uh, a suggestion that, um, and it can be quite challenging, is to reread passage, these verses, but instead of saying the word love, Say I. And then read it to self. So I would say love is um, I am patient. I am kind. I am not envious. I don't boast. I'm not proud. And, and so on. And that's quite challenging. If I was to reread it and say, Am I patient? Not a little bit, sometimes, not always. Am I kind? Sometimes, a little bit, not always, and so on. I don't have any of those 15 things in my life that are perfect. All of them, there's room for improvement. It was interesting to hear the message version because where mine would say, oh, actually mine does say something similar, it keeps no record of wrongs. We can be resentful, can't we, because of something that's happened to us in the past? Because our memory doesn't forget things that are hurtful. Yet, in Peter's letter, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, love for each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now that doesn't mean to brush something under the carpet, um, pretend it hasn't happened and um, if somebody's uh, applied that verse incorrectly in terms of safeguarding over the years they're completely wrong um, it's not referring to something like that but we often do hurt each other don't we uh, as a community in our families workplaces and we remember those things love is a choice it's an act of the will if we just wait for feelings to happen, we might be waiting for a long time. Love is a choice. We choose to be patient. We choose to be kind. We choose not to be envious. We choose 
not to keep a record of wrong. Perhaps we could ask someone, someone we trust, what they notice about us. Perhaps if there's one or two things that, you know, we're lacking. If they come back with all 15, that would probably be too much, and I suggest a bit unkind. But maybe we can think and pray about these qualities for ourselves. Maybe certain people come to mind as we go through the, the, the 15 phrases. Or there may be situations that maybe next time we would hope to do differently. Well, we can pray to God, who is love and the source of love, knowing that he loves us. And perhaps even now, as I've said this, someone or an incident has come to mind. And we might need to pray like this. I'll use my own word, but you could insert somebody else's, my name. So, dear God, forgive me for being irritable with James. Or it may be something else, not just irritable. Instead, help me to love James be more, and to be more tolerant and patient with him. Amen. Well, imagine what our community would be like if we all practised this. Wow, it would be a loving community that I certainly would want to be part of. And also the wider community, our family, friends and neighbours. So, if you have to take anything away from this, take these first few verses, four to seven, Read them, put your name there, and pray through those verses. I really implore you to do that. So lastly, the third part. Love never fails, love never ends. Perhaps this is what my mum was thinking about when she chose this passage to be read at her funeral. Because despite what she'd done in life, and, and a lot of things, those things ended with her. It was her love that continued, <clears throat> because love is the most excellent way. We receive God's love, so let's respond to God's love by loving him and loving one another. I want to finish by quoting Tom Wright, and this, this little sort of uh, section fits well, really well, with the vision of our church which is to be living life together in the flow of God's love. And we do this in and through and by relationship. Tom Wright says, Love is God's river, flowing on into the future, across the border into the country where there is no pride, no jostling for position, no contention among God's people. We are invited to step into that river here and now and let it take us where it is going. Amen. Thanks, James. Just take a moment to reflect on what we've heard. And, you know, perhaps there's a nugget or that you heard in James' talk, something that God laid on your heart, an action to take, a person to pray for, a relationship to mend. Lord, may your word become flesh in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please stand if you are able. Thank you. So we affirm our faith.
on the third page of our little white sheets. We believe in God, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God, the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we pray and sing the song number 18, Don't Let My Love Grow Cold. Then, if you don't know it, just pray the words, um, or mumble your way through um, with the tunes at work. people never forget that you are love and you call us to love as you loved us. Help us to love you with heart, soul, mind and strength and to love one another. May we live life together Lord as your people in the flow of your love. 
save us from the traps of individualism and only loving those who think and behave like us. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Lord, set us all on fire with the power of your love and burn from us all that dims your light. Kindle, we pray, an answering flame in the lives of those around us, particularly those who don't know your love or have forgotten your love, those who are desperate for love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Lord, today we give you thanks for the ministry of Ethan amongst us, and particularly his ministry amongst our young people over these last years. Thank you for how he has blessed us all with his love and compassion, insight and laughter. Guide and protect Ethan and our young people in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Lord, we bring before you people in places where love is very absent, and violence, hatred, greed and indifference bring war, famine, persecution and loneliness. In a moment of silence we call to mind places near and far, known to us and known only to God, where there needs to be a holy intrusion of peace and love. Prosper the work of peacemakers and peacekeepers, and all involved in diplomacy, mediation and conflict resolution. And for our own leaders at every level in society, they will be inspired to work for the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling in body, mind, spirit or relationship. Pray especially for Andy Royal, who's been unwell of late, who's asked for our prayers. Bring an end to their sufferings, Lord, and a resolution to their difficulties. And show us the best way to help those who suffer without being intrusive, but without simply turning away from their pain either. And Lord, for homes and lives where love is absent or grown cold, come close, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. We remember those who have departed this life and now see face to face. And we give you thanks and praise for the love that brings life out of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Lord, your love flows like a stream into the ocean of your grace. Your love encircles this world, displays your faithfulness. Your love is patient and kind, brings wholeness and true peace. Your love is all that we desire to heal our brokenness and make us come alive. All things will pass and fade, but your love remains eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in love the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. If I could invite 
Ethan to come forward. And I think Nicolette's just going to get a few characters from next door. <laughs> and while we just wait, um, thank you, Ethan, for being amongst us and for your ministry as you've coordinated over the last three years. Funding came to an end at the beginning of January for Ethan's post, but I'm delighted he's here today. It's still very much a, a part of us. And as we said in the, in the press, you will love, I think that's a real feature of Ethan's character. He's such a loving, compassionate soul. And the young people have been on the end of that, and we've all been on the end of that too. So thank you for that, for your love and compassion. For your humour, your laughter, your insight and wisdom, sometimes way beyond your years. Um, but no, it's been a delight to work with you. So we've got a little, um, we've, been, we've been having a little uh, gathering of thank yous. And lots of people actually have sent me messages on it and said, I can't be here today. Can you pass on my my love and thanks to Ethan. So there's a lot of a lot of love and thank yous out there for you. And um, there's a little something coming forward for you uh, now, I think. And if yeah, Zach and Rosario and Chantel and, and any of the others who want to come up with you. Team's leaving their seat. That's a gift. Well, look, <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Chantal, um, do you want to say anything on behalf of it? <laughs> Either it's just a thank you. Yeah, I suppose we all just want to say thank you. Like Ethan's put in a lot of work, especially over the pandemic, so it's just a big thank you, really. Yeah. Well said. teaching me admin skills. <laughs> so he really deserves a big thanks. Um, again, thank you to all for your prayers. Thank you for the young people and the families. Um, it's been a real privilege to work with young people. They're a really, really special bunch. I've done quite a bit of youth work over my few years I've been about. And, you know, I'm really proud of them. I think we at the parish can be proud of our young people. They're a really, really special bunch. Um, so thank you. And for your family for your support. And finally, thank you to Emma for being here, and Non, and John Ross, and our wonderful team. Um, I care very deeply for our young people, so part of me thinks, he's going to look after them now. But we've got Emma, and Emma is fantastic, and she's wonderful, and we really believe that God brought us Emma as a real gift, so thank you as well. And sorry if I forgot to say thank you to anyone else, but thank you. <laughs> And Ethan, just we pray God's blessing 
uh, upon you and may God prosper the work that you do in his name in the days to come. And we hope you'll still hang about and be a part of the body here in some shape or form. Great. Thank you. Oh. I publish the Bands of Marriage between Neil Edward Reed, Parish of Tidenham, and Tony Louise Powell, also the Parish of Tidenham. This is the third and final time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. And Father, we pray your blessing upon Neil and Tony. Bless them in all their preparations and on their wedding day. Give them your love in their hearts throughout their married life together. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please do, over the coming days and weeks ahead, pray for us to be the community God wants us to be. I know we've been banging on about it for a few weeks now. But I think it is really important that we hear God's call to be the people he calls us to be. And um, we're all a part of that. And to be open to what he wants us to be as individuals and as a community knit together in him. I give the invitation again, if you fancy popping along to uh, a life group, poking your head around the door, or you have, uh, or just want to meet with others to pray, to natter through life, then do make those approaches. We can journey together. And um, there'll be coffee after the service today, for the first time in ages. <laughs> and, um, and I'll also give, give us a chance to say a big thank you individually to, to Ethan if we want to. Um, and we continue, as restrictions change, in church we'll continue to be as safe as possible, to respect each other's uh, space. We perhaps just don't assume that the person next to you wants a gigantic hug and, uh, and be smothered with kisses. Just keep, um, keep being aware of each other's needs as we move forward. Some of us are still anxious and some of us are just ready to do anything. Um, it seems. But so just hold that that balance well. And we'll probably continue to have the face coverings for a, a little while yet, um, so that everybody can access the worship who wants to come along. Please stand. Let us praise the Lord. Ten thousand reasons. Ten thousand one.
Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each of you, your homes, and those you love and pray for, this day and always. Amen. Amen. So go out there to love and serve the Lord. Amen.